Suddenly, it was 25 years later. I was old, sitting in a red room. The American primetime television landscape in the late 80s was in transition, but it was still oversaturated with unambitious soap operas and conventional laugh track family sitcoms. TV was at the bottom of the media hierarchy. It was called the idiot box to underline its intrinsic lack of any artistic or intellectual value. Then came Twin Peaks. It was the spring of 1990 when the show first aired on the ABC network and launched a national obsession over who killed Laura Palmer. The show marked a turning point in the history of television, starting with the evident dramatic change in visual style. Twin Peaks was the communal effort of TV writer Mark Frost and film director David Lynch, who co-created this puzzling and dark universe we're about to dive into again more than 25 years later with the upcoming new season. Twin Peaks proved to be a game changer, with enduring resonance within popular culture. The show foreshadowed today's binge-watching environment and paved the way for TV to transform from the boob tube into a critically acclaimed form of artistic storytelling. So how did Twin Peaks do all of that? And after this video, if you'd like to know 25 facts about Twin Peaks, head to our friends at All Time Movies. The midget did a dance, Laura kissed me, and she whispered the name of the killer in my ear. Who was it? I don't remember. Damn. Damn. To start off, it was daring. It was a multi-layered genre hybrid, a blend of mysterious detective investigation and soap opera drama with shocking horror turns and slapstick comedy moments. It reflected a, a fuller sense of the, the, the full spectrum of what life is. Life is hilarious and it's terrifying mm -hmm. and it's moving and it's touching and it's romantic and it's uh, all those things. So we, we tried to create a full kind of smorgasbord there. It's not a puzzle at all. It's a map. With so many things going on, the narrative arc required a new structural formula, one that refused the need for plot closure within every episode. The king must die. Before Twin Peaks, there had been a few attempts at serial storytelling and interweaving plot lines in genres that were usually bound to the episodic form. Think Hill Street Blues, Cheers, or St. Elsewhere. But these shows still regularly achieved closure within a few episodes, and the story arcs that did span over seasons relied on character growth rather than story structure. Twin Peaks showed that a more experimental formula could catch on with audiences. Episodes raised a lot of questions without feeling obligated to supply the answers punctually, or perhaps ever. Audiences are challenged to navigate through uncanny plots and subplots involving multiple realities, doppelgangers, psychological disorders, dream sequences, and the occult. Very early on in the series, the comprehensible, logic-driven investigations are subverted by the supernatural, a presence that plays a crucial part in the story. For example, in Cooper's Dr. method Lawrence of investigating Jacobi. the murder, guided by his dreams and intuitions. Dr. Lawrence Jacoby. You did it! You hit it! Lucy, make a note that the bottle was struck, but did not break. Very important. And in the villain Bob, an ungraspable, demonic force that possesses human beings and feeds on pain and terror. After the resolution of the Laura Palmer murder mystery, something that Lynch reportedly never intended to resolve, the second season went so far to the extremes of a free associative, unstructured format that it tested some audiences' patience and ultimately got cancelled, ending on a cliffhanger. The messier second season also reflected behind-the-scenes conflicts, as Lynch left the show after having a very hard time swallowing the constraints imposed by ABC about the Laura Palmer resolution. There was room for so many other, you know, mysteries, but that mystery was sacred, and it held the other ones. It was the tree, and the other ones were the branches. You want to know who killed Laura? Gil did! <laughs> we all did. One of the most amazingly good things about this show is its visual world. Even though Lynch only directed six episodes out of 30, other directors took their lead from Lynch's eccentric vision, while bringing their own sensibility to the work. While most TV fictions took care to erase the presence of the camera, the Lynch Frost production overturned television grammar to visually amplify meaning. They brought cinematic visual language to TV, 
Of course, the series still made use of some common TV visual conventions like shot reverse shot, but Twin Peaks' cinematography includes innovations like unusual camera angles to create emphasis on the emotional distress of a character, deep depth of field to create strong compositions, camera movement to enhance the drama of a scene, and emptiness within the frame as an ominous sign. In the eerie, unsettling moments of the show, dread and horror are designed around the stillness of the frame, taking a cue from the cinematic style of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. These shots arouse creepiness and anxiety by creating an ambiguity around what the precise nature of the threat actually is. The fascination with feelings is another visual attribute of the show, which translates to a tendency to hold the camera on a given emotion or detail for much longer than we'd expect. <laughs> And it's a show that's willing to let this moment play in full. And funny to your ear, a little bit tumble and jivey. Say, mares eat oats, and does eat oats, and little lambs eat ivy. With all of these sophisticated visual techniques, Twin Peaks helped legitimize television as an art form, creating the origin point of auteur TV. The atmosphere of Twin Peaks is really the kicker of the show, as evidenced by how many have tried to emulate it in the years since. There are many different moods and tonalities within the series, ranging from the darkest nightmarish sight to the cotton candy feel of the local diner. But the key mood the show establishes is an ominous one, ever lurking underneath the surface of harmless Americana. This Lynchian motif also occurs in the director's acclaimed film Blue Velvet, which has a lot in common with Twin Peaks. Both are mystery stories set in lumbering towns that dig below a white picket fence version of America in search of the hidden. The visual motif that exemplifies the dark quality of the series is the repetition of detailed naturalistic elements, such as the water flowing, the owl, and the woods, elements that here conceal obscure, menacing forces. The sinister state of mind is also mirrored and intensified by the soundtrack, composed by Angelo Badalamenti. The show's unique, haunting musical identity works as a powerful emotional trigger, and just like the themes they're underscoring, the compositions have both a light and dark quality. The lighter music has a 50s or 60s feel, sparkling guitars, finger-snapping jazz, Here's Lois glasses that you wanted. and teen pop mushiness, to suggest lover's innocence and a sense of romantic longing. The darker themes feature synth soundscapes, marked by harmonic suspensions and dissonance, where the unnatural timbre of the electronic instruments evokes the otherworldly. The score participates in the storytelling by using leitmotifs, or recurring musical themes associated with a certain character, emotion, or idea. Quite famously, flashlight beam moves across the ground and a hand a gloved hand lifts a rock and takes out a necklace broken in half it was Laura's Meanwhile, the blend of musical styles also gives Twin Peaks an anachronistic feel. While the series is set in 1989 and captures that late 80s texture, it also seems apart from any time, which may be one reason it hasn't lost its power. Somehow, we feel like the world of Twin Peaks is really out there somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, untouched by time, even when the camera's not pointing at it. Another touchstone of the series is its memorable characters. We learn right away that the inhabitants of Twin Peaks are not what they seem. At the beginning, everyone is a suspect. Behind every innocent appearance, there lies darkness within. This is especially true of Laura, the shining homecoming queen whose death is followed by one sordid revelation after another. 
In addition to the mystery element of neighbors as suspects, the show develops its soap operatic and personal intrigue elements. Almost everyone in town is caught up in intricate love affairs. But most important are the quirks and peculiarities that make the Twin Peaks characters so brilliant. It's an ensemble, character-driven show. Diane, 11.30 a.m., February 24th. Entering the town of Twin Peaks, five miles south of the Canadian border, 12 miles west of the state line. Never seen so many trees in my life. And as the show develops, Agent Dale Cooper becomes one of the most compelling TV characters in screen no. history. This is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. Audiences fall for his idiosyncrasies, his childlike hey, enthusiasm for Jeff. trees, and his obsessions with coffee. Can we offer you gentlemen a cup of joe? Mrs. Packard, you said the magic word. Cherry pies. Two more pieces of this incredible pie and the significance of Tibet. Following a dream I had three years ago, I have become deeply moved by the plight of the Tibetan people and filled with a desire to help them. It was giving a little bit of a story, a little bit of plot, but it really established the character, so you had a sense of, man, this guy is very different. Audrey, that rightward slant in your handwriting indicates a romantic nature. A heart that yearns. Be careful. I do. Every scene is a chance to observe the highly specific traits that the characters bring to screen, which are ultimately an intimate window into an odd society. And uh, officers and men will be allowed to return to their home, not to be disturbed by the Confederate States of the Holy Land. The idea for all this really came from a dream? Yes, it did. Of course, Twin Peaks' ambition in both narrative and thematic density makes it a demanding show for viewers. Whereas television up to this point was often experienced as a disrupted activity, as viewers would change channels or keep the TV on as background noise while performing other tasks, Twin Peaks required attentive participation. The show's ambiguity and opacity make it a subjective experience, where the boundaries between dream, reality, and fantasy are blurred. The viewer becomes a creator of meaning, and that's not an easy job. Break the code, solve the crime. The code, solve the crime. Since the early 90s, television has changed radically. It would be wrong to credit this one show for all that's taken place after it. Still, it's hard to imagine what TV would be like nowadays in the so-called golden age of television if the cinematic, enigmatic, ultimately impenetrable Twin Peaks had never been created. Everywhere we look, we find series that share some of their DNA with Twin Peaks, what or somehow pay tribute to it. Me want to know why town is called Twin Peaks. For instance, Twin Peaks' interest in the uncanny can also be seen in hits like The X-Files, a decade later, Lost, and most recently, Stranger Things. Crucially, Twin Peaks paved the way for stories that revolve around not just a specific self-contained enigma to resolve, but also a larger place we're initiated into, whose nature is to be explored in a more rounded, intuitive investigation. It taught TV authors to trust instinct over intellect, mood over meaning, and to emphasize the journey over the destination. Yet the show's real importance lay not in its direct influences, but in the way it changed the perception of the medium and how viewers experience it. Suddenly, television was full of possibilities. Harry, I have no idea where this will lead us, but I have a definite feeling it will be a place both wonderful and strange.